it's a huge pleasure and honor for me to, a huge pleasure personally as well as professionally, to be able to take part in this tribute to Ronald Dworkin, whom I have known for many years since he was my doctoral mentor at Oxford, and to pay tribute to him not just for the, um, for the mentoring that he has given me, but for the power of the ideas and the riches that he has contributed to the philosophy of law. Um, you have just had a sample of those riches, and I will not go over them with you, because I want most of all today to engage with Professor Dworkin on some of the questions about legal positivism that he has just alluded to um, in his comments. But perhaps I can best frame what I want to talk about by um, discussing the way in which in his, not his latest book, it's hard to keep track of them all, but in his, I think, uh, second latest book, Justice in Robes, the way in which in that book, Professor Dworkin makes explicit a connection between his theory of law as integrity, a theory which commands us in our practice of law, in adjudication, and in our making of law, to see the, le the legal enterprises primarily keeping faith with a coherent body of principle that governs all of us in the exercise of power over one another in a community. Professor Dworkin has taken that idea of integrity and brought it now explicitly into relation with one of the most ancient principles of jurisprudence, the principle of the rule of law, or as he sometimes calls it, legality. He has brought these two ideas into explicit relation and presented law as integrity as an interpretation of this ancient ideal to which our profession uh, bears the deepest allegiance, the principle of uh, the rule of law. And it's, it means, it signals a new phase, I think, in Professor Dworkin's engagement with legal positivism, a new phase in his critique of legal positivism. One could say that at the beginning of his work, Professor Dworkin criticized legal positivism on structural grounds. Legal positivism failed to give a proper account of the structure and character of legal reasoning. It failed to give an account of the deep embedded principles that one finds in the law but which cannot be tested or recognized in any sort of algorithmic sense by a rule of recognition. It failed to give an account of the presence of principles in a legal system which is as much a moral presence as the presence of enacted law. And it failed to give an account, therefore, of the way in which the norms that we apply in legal decision making relate to one another and relate to the human decisions that have come in the past. That was a structural critique of legal positivism. I believe now by uh, bringing his theory of integrity into relation with the rule of law or legality, Professor Dworkin is now engaging also in a deep and substantive engagement with legal positivism. We heard about this a moment ago when he suggested that it is the best way to understand legal positivism is not as a conceptual thesis or as an analytic thesis about law, but as a way of thinking about the importance of certain substantive values like predictability or authority or coordination or democracy and the way in which that should bear on, on uh, what we recognize as law and what we take legal decision-making to be. Professor Dworkin, it now seems to me, is interested in engaging with the positivist claim that those values, like predictability, that those values are the key to jurisprudence and are the key to thinking uh, uh, in a deep and satisfactory way about uh, legal decision-making. You see... At the beginning of legal positivism, particularly at the beginning of the positivist tradition that I know best, which is early English positivism, the tradition that began with Thomas Hobbes, which reached its culmination in the work of Jeremy Bentham, and which you find in the various realist traditions, the, the, the more sober 
of the American realists, the intensely sober Scandinavian realists, and which one finds still traces of in some modern positivists. The idea was that we needed to understand law in a way which would facilitate and make possible the workings of a complex society, in which people needed fair warning of the way in which power would be exercised over them, in which people needed to be able to create and sustain expectations that could frame their um, decision-making and their interaction with others, in which people needed settlement, authoritative settlement of the disputes that would arise among a society comprising millions of quarrelsome and opinionated individuals, in which people needed to have institutions which enabled uh, uh, decisions to be made in a way that respected the political engagement of ordinary men and women in a democracy, and in which those decisions made in democratic institutions could then govern and permeate decision-making throughout the society. Those values, those needs of a modern society were taken by positivists to be directly engaged in their view of what law should be. It was part of, for example, Jeremy Bentham's critique of the English common law, that it simply failed to serve those values of predictability, coordination, authority, and democracy, because it provided a body of law, if one could call it that, that was intensely unpredictable, that varied with the subjectivity of each judge, that did not provide any basis for secure expectations, because the common law seemed to be wrapped up in the mysteries of individualized case-by-case -case adjudication, that did not provide for the settlement of disputes because disputes could be reopened at any stage by a, um, a judge's decisions, and that did not respect the democratic authority of representative legislatures because it provided for a basis whereby judges could revisit the main issues that representative legislatures had already addressed. So in the early tradition of positivism, positivism was not an analytic thesis, it was a political thesis. And it was a thesis that those values of predictability and so on were key to thinking about the proper role of law in society. Now, one of the most attractive, one of the many attractive features of Professor Dworkin's jurisprudence is, I believe, that he has always recognized that. Although he has taken time to dismiss the view of positivism as an analytic thesis, I believe he respects it and engages with it most thoughtfully as a substantive political thesis. He did this in Law's Empire. He has done it, I think, in all the work that we have seen since. And I think it is, it is an engagement, a substantive engagement with positivism that we also see in his explicit relation of integrity now to legality or the rule of law. Let me explain what I mean. Those values that I talked about as the foundation of legal positivism, those values of predictability, settlement, coordination, authority, and democracy, those are values that arguably have as strong a claim to represent the core of the rule of law tradition as the claim that integrity might make to represent the core of the rule of law tradition. When people have spoken over the last 2,000 years or more about a society governed by laws, not by men, when people have spoken of the rule of law ideal, what they have had in mind is a situation in which power would be disciplined by general rules established in advance that would be public and visible features of the environment in which people made their life together, which would settle and not allow for the continuation of moral disputes in the society, which would allow for determinate centers of power to be the recognized focus of social decision, and would create predictable features in an environment that could be as calculable, I guess, as the laws of nature in figuring out how to exercise our freedom. Those ideas which positivism has made central to its mission have also always been part of the rule of law tradition. 
So when Professor Dworkin now identifies law as integrity with the rule of law tradition, there is now a direct challenge, if you like, for this much coveted uh, theoretical ground. Now, in some of my work, I have tried to emphasize that the rule of law, this ancient ideal to which we as lawyers owe our deepest allegiance, the rule of law is a complicated, controversial, intensely contested concept. It is a very, very big umbrella under which a number of picnics may be held. It is a very, very large tent in which a number of campers might stake their claim. It is a complex ideal, and probably there is room for uh, many different aspects of it. And the aspects that the positivists have emphasized, predictability, coordination, settlement, authority, democracy, and so on, those aspects do not necessarily occupy all the space. The rule of law has always emphasized equality before the law. It has always emphasized the role of law in facilitating and making possible the use of human intelligence and reason rather than mere whim and fiat in human affairs. And Professor Dworkin can rightly claim that the idea of law as integrity represents a good interpretation of a number of other values associated with the rule of law. It's a good interpretation of equality before the, the law, which is not just a mantra from Albert Van Dicey, but as a deep idea that people have a claim to be treated according to the same principles and in the spirit of the same principles as other people have been treated. And it can certainly claim, Laura's integrity can certainly claim to represent the strong connection between the rule of law and the facilitation of reason and intelligence in, uh, in human affairs. So there is room enough under the heading of legality for these diverse conceptions to flourish. But the question that I would like to pose today is this. If we regard law as integrity, as a conception of the rule of law, if we regard law as integrity as a way of highlighting the equality and rationality values associated with the rule of law, how should we as partisans of this particular tradition, think about these other values that the positivists emphasized. Because the importance of predictability in human affairs doesn't go away when we emphasize the importance of equality and integrity. The importance of settlement in human affairs and coordination doesn't go away when we emphasize the importance of promoting rational and intelligent discussion in the community. The concerns that the positivists had are real concerns, and they are not obliterated, nor should they be forgotten when we emphasize this other range of concerns to which integrity, or law as integrity, particularly draws our attention. Let me illustrate the concern, the, 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 the particular nature of the concern that I have. We know that a judge or a practitioner responding to the uh, discipline and the ideals of law as integrity faces a tremendously difficult and convoluted task. A task which, as Professor Dworkin has emphasized, doesn't merely entangle moral disputes, excuse me, moral considerations and legal considerations, but presents those as diverse departments of the overall moral enterprise, the judge who accepts the discipline of law and as integrity has to find a way of seeing the law as a whole, of discerning its underlying spirit and coherence, and of choosing between rival accounts of the underlying spirit and coherence of the law in ways that are sensitive to values of right and justice. This is a demanding assignment which law as integrity poses and we call the judges who perform this assignment at least in our legal models we call them by the names of demigods Hercules to emphasize how complicated and difficult and challenging this assignment is 
Now, it may be difficult, but here's the point. It seems to me quite wrong to assume that any two judges facing up to this assignment in the best spirit will necessarily come to the same answer. If Hercules is addressing a question in one courtroom and another god or goddess, Heraclea, is addressing the similar questions in another courtroom, it is possible, it is to be expected in human affairs that they may come up with different answers. I don't mean that they simply impose their own whims or their own subjective values. Each of these gods, each of these judges, asks the questions that law as integrity requires him or her to ask, asks those questions in a spirit of objectivity, asks those questions in a way that seeks assiduously and objectively the right answer. Right? But asking a question, what is the right answer, answering that question in a spirit of objectivity doesn't guarantee that your answer will be the same as anybody else's. People working in a spirit of objectivity come up with different answers. We know this. Yeah? And talk of the right answer is not the same as talk of uniformity. And as Professor Dworkin has emphasized in his work, if we value integrity, we do not value it for the sake of uniformity, but we value it precisely for the discipline of objectivity that it imposes on each judge. That's fine, but go back to these two courtrooms, Hercules in one, Heraclea in the other. Hercules has asked himself the deep value questions and has become convinced that answers we would call liberal answers are the best understanding, the best objective understanding of justice and right. Heraclea, asking herself the same questions in the same spirit, has come up with answers that we might regard as more conservative. And so a litigant appearing before Heraclea and hearing about what is happening in the other courtroom may well lament his bad luck in being put before a conservative judge subject to this discipline of law as integrity, as opposed to the liberal judge in the next courtroom. Or may, if this is a high court, lament his bad luck in appearing before a court in which Heraclea was in the majority, as opposed to a court in which Hercules was in. There's nothing skeptical about this. The only skeptical note I am sounding is that men and women of good faith asking objective questions in an objective spirit may come up with different answers, because the right answer does not disclose itself in neon from the skies. So as it appears to the litigant appearing before Justice Heraclea, there is something arbitrary, maybe something even unfair, in the fact that an exactly similar case in the next courtroom is being disposed of in a different way. Moreover, that litigant didn't know in advance which of these justices he would appear before. And so he might say there is something unpredictable. He couldn't base his affairs on any fair estimate of which of these justices he would appear before or what their reasoning would be. So that is the difficulty, I think, that is faced. It's not a difficulty that integrity deals with on its own terms. It's a difficulty that only becomes apparent when we ask ourselves about this other array of values that the positivists have always emphasized. So let me end by just um, thinking in terms of four questions we might pose to Professor Dworkin. I have these written down. And, um, I, I hope you have the answers written down. <laughs> the answers are written down, but they, uh, that's right. <laughs> so the general spirit of these questions is, do we have anything to lose in the way of substantive value? <clears throat> when we abandon legal positivism in favor of the discipline of law as integrity. That's the general spirit of the four questions. And the first question is, do we lose anything in the way of uniformity, particularly uniformity of decision among judges, when we move away from a legal tradition that emphasizes a common orientation to enacted texts towards a legal tradition that emphasizes reasoning on a whole interrelated array of moral questions. Do we lose anything in the way of uniformity for the sake of, as Professor Dworkin would put it, asking 
the right questions and trying to get the right answers uh, to these morally uh, deeper questions. Is there likely to be the same divergence among positivist judges? Judges who accept the best version of the discipline that legal positivism imposes as we would find among judges who accept the best version of the discipline that law as integrity would impose. And if there is less divergence among judges on the positivist model, is that loss of uniformity a cost? And what should we say about it? <coughs> then connected with that, do we lose anything in the way of predictability? Remember our hapless defendant appearing before Heraclea rather than Hercules, but not knowing in advance of the hearing which of the judges on the bench responding to this discipline of integrity, which of the judges on the bench he would be appearing in front of. Predictability is sometimes regarded as the most important of the rule of law values, and it is sometimes thought that a jurisprudence that provides a basis for the clear recognition of public texts and for legal decision making that is oriented strictly towards the meaning of those texts serves that value of predictability better than a jurisprudence which requires each judge to come up with his own or her own evaluative interpretation of the spirit of the whole corpus juris. Does that make law less calculable in advance by ordinary citizens? And if it does, what are we to say about that cost? Is that a cost worth bearing? Is it a cost that is compensated for in other ways? Thirdly, do we lose anything in the way of authority and settlement? In the Hobbesian vision of society, we are quarrelsome animals who disagree about anything and who are willing to fight for the things that we disagree about. And the price of peace is the acceptance of what might appear to be arbitrary settlements in one domain after another, so that we can orient ourselves to the same answer to the questions on which we disagree, even though we are in conflict with each other about the merits of the answer. But settlement itself is valued. Do we lose anything in the way of settlement when we move from a positivist account to, a, um, to an account oriented towards law as integrity? Do we lose anything away in the way of the conflict reduction and coordination, that Hobbesian settlement or Benthamite settlement seems to make possible? And finally, and I, I mentioned this fourth question because I think Professor Dworkin has done remarkable work in behalf of legal positivism, work that modern positivists have failed to do in showing the connection between the tradition of legal positivism at its best and the tradition of democracy, showing how positivists didn't have a disconnect at the best of their tradition, between their legal philosophy and their political philosophy, but that they saw legal positivism as a philosophy for Democrats, as a philosophy that, that allowed us to ensure that the decisions made in a representative forum would have authority throughout the legal system. Do we lose anything in the way of democracy or in the, in the modes of making democracy effective? when we move away from a, um, a tradition that emphasizes orientation towards the text, the products that emerge from representative institutions. When we move away from a tradition that tries to limit the independent discretion or reasoning or decision making of judges. When we move away from that positivist tradition towards the more intelligent questions that law as integrity directs us to ask and answer uh, in the legal tradition, do we lose anything in the way of, of democracy? Now, it seems to me those four questions uh, are questions that Professor Dworkin's engagement of law as integrity with the rule of law compel us to answer. Um, he can tell us what the answers will be. I have them written down here, as I, as I said. But I think, I mean, one thing we have to bear in mind and ask ourselves all the time as we, as we pose these questions is whether the ideals and the values that positivism has put forward are in fact practicable in a modern, complex 
uh, society. And it may well be that what law as integrity can say to us in, respond to, in response to these concerns is that our society has now become a society of a sort in which that sort of simple-minded predictability, simple-minded uniformity, simple and straightforward lines of democratic authority are simply not available. I mean, I suspect that's one possible line that may be taken, but I am most anxious to hear what Professor Dworkin will say in response. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Guys. Those are, <coughs> those are wonderful questions, Jeremy, and I'm very grateful. They're, they're, they're as you say, absolutely, absolutely at the center of what I'm trying to uh, direct attention to in legal theory. Uh, I think the answer to the question you gave at the end is exactly the right answer. I have, <laughs> I have very little to add to it. But I was I'll, taking your time, so I thought I should <laughs> But I'll, I'll uh, just expand on it a bit. See, I think the problem that you identified just at the end was already a problem for Jeremy Bentham. That by that time, his complaint was anachronistic. Let's, let's divide cases. I agree this is uh, simplistic. But there are cases that never come to court, arguments that never come to court. Or if they come to court, it's only because people think they can prove their own view of what the facts are. There's no dispute about the law. These are the cases in which law is integrity and a more positivist approach to law would come to the same answer. Why? Because, as I I uh, think I said a few moments ago, the virtues that Jeremy named, the virtues of predictability, are not <coughs> independent of fairness. They're not competitors to fairness. They're part of fairness. And in my view, efficiency is too. So in the enormous bulk of cases, of, I shouldn't even say cases, of legal disputes or of disputes raising controversies about what the law might be thought to be, there isn't really an issue of law. Now, cases come to court, and a tiny fraction of those go up to superior courts on appeal and a tiny fraction of those end up in case books, which Jeremy and others here teach from. And these are cases as to which there is no formula of predictability. If you take the presently fashionable formulation of a positivist view, namely, the law is what a rule of recognition accepted by all lawyers identifies as the law. Then you see, and then you read a few case books, you see that the argument is precisely in many cases about how the intention of a legislature should be understood. And simply to repeat the mantra, we should do what the legislature says because that's the democratic thing to do, doesn't deliver a result. It merely sets the question. Now, sophisticated lawyers in the positivist tradition therefore say that at some point the law runs out. They're faced with a dilemma. You can either say in these hard cases the defendant always wins because the plaintiff can't prove that the law is on his or her side. Nobody knows what the legislature intended. Legislature never thought of this. Nobody knows what the judge who decided some case 30 years ago would have said now. How can you know that? So, these positivists say, in these cases, the law runs out. And, magic word, which I warn you against, it's a moment for the judge to exercise discretion. 
Now, what happens to Jeremy's long list of virtues? Predictability, authority, democracy. As soon as the word discretion enters, those are all out the window anyway. <clears throat> As you said, Jeremy, we have a complex society. If we took the only available course to avoid discretion, which is to adopt a rule, even this rule wouldn't always work, when the law is in dispute, the plaintiff gets sent home with nothing, then the law would stagnate, and the use of the law as a tool for coordination, the virtues of efficiency that you celebrate, would, of course, simply disappear. The law would stagnate. That's not an available act. So discretion. Judges legislate. Judges decide what's best. Hercules legislates in one way, and Heraclea in the next court legislates another way. The ideal of a uniform pattern of decision isn't available no matter what legal theory you adopt. Now, against that background, I will hazard the claim that an integrity-based adjudication gives you more of those very values. It gives you, uh, Jeremy gave the illustration of two judges in different courts having picnics under different parts of the umbrella, and they come out with different decisions. And so long as we talk about discretion, there is nothing that asks either of them to look over his or her shoulder at what the other one is doing. But that is exactly what integrity asks them to do. It says, always understand that the principles that you apply in one domain must be respected in the other domain unless there's a principled reason for not. So, you summarize your question. What do we have to lose of these enormously important values and virtues, and my answer is nothing. <laughs> we have only to go. <laughs> want to come back to you? Yeah. We, we, we have some time for Jeremy to come back. I mean, if, if I can just, just push the matter a little further. Um, I mean, I, I think these, this is exactly it's exactly the answers that I had written down. And, and, uh, <laughs> not because um, these are predictable answers, but they seem to me to be the best that can be said in response to these concerns about predictability and authority. But here are, here are two further questions, follow-ups, I think, about this. Should we then regard predictability and uniformity as values that are best appreciated under the auspices of integrity, not just as, as um, outcomes that may collaterally benefit from the pursuit of justice as integrity, but should we regard the values of predictability, authority, settlement, and so on, as values that judges responding to the discipline of law as integrity should also think of themselves as responsive to. So when Hercules is in his courtroom and he knows what Justice Heraclea is doing in the next courtroom and likely to do, should that in some way influence the way he makes his decisions? It is certainly the, true on the, on, the, um, on the law as integrity account that he should try to keep faith with whatever has been established in the legal system so far. His own decisions and the previous decisions of Heraclea J to the extent that he knows about them. But does this account now of the way in which integrity might serve predictability and uniformity require him to, as it were, constrain his own thinking, his own juridical thinking, by some norm of collegiality or orientation towards present uniformity? Does predictability and uniformity therefore enter into his calculations? as a particular way of pursuing integrity? I think that's, that's the question. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the answer is yes. And I think it enters at a very early level, deeper than 
should I take account of decisions that I anticipate yes. other judges making in, let's say, the historical present. It enters <coughs> into the justification of the institutions, the large institutions of legislation and precedent. When I uh, constructed my fantasy about a domestic dispute and tried to suggest how law might develop along grander <coughs> lines, uh, but taking the same directions, I think I said, one of the questions that has to be asked about every institution that lawyers confront is, what's the point of having that institution? And when a judge asks the question that I said must be asked inevitably, how should we understand a statute? Yes, we are obliged to respect statutes. Why? Because of predictability, coordination, and so forth. All these virtues come in. But what does it mean to respect a statute? The statute says not too onerous. How shall we decide what a reasonable restraint of trade is, for example? Then, at that point, in constructing a theory of statutory interpretation, the questions that <coughs> lawyers sometimes describe as questions of workability, questions of guidance to the profession, to the legal profession, to judges in inferior courts, are front and center in their thinking. So the answer to the question is, yes, more conspicuously, given the complexities of a continental economy or an international economy, more conspicuously than under a Benthamite theory. Yeah. 